Hi, Grandma here, and I'm reading uh, The Door in the Wall. Um, on this book, I'm going to work mostly on uh, understanding vocabulary and context. That's the uh, reading strategy that we're using. But I want to remind you also uh, of uh, making a movie in your head as I read. It's particularly important in this next chapter as they are describing the monastery and the life in the monastery and what's going on there. Now, if you'll recall, we're working on vocabulary and using context clues. The first paragraph of this <clears throat> uh, chapter is a good example of it. May came in with a burst of bloom in hedge and field. There was hawthorn, both pink and white, and primroses, and buttercups carpeted the fields with yellow. In every garden, wallflowers blossomed in bright color and filled the air with perfume. Now, you may not know what a hawthorn looks like or a primrose or a buttercup or even a wallflower, but you do know that they are blooming flowers, and that's enough. You don't really need to know specifically what each word is. Uh, if you are interested, what I sometimes do is I to have a post-it note and I'll write the word down on my post-it note and then look it up later because I know it's not really important in the um, in the plot it's important for the setting but I can get a picture of what blooming flowers look like for days Robin was cared for as if he were a little child brother Luke brought him food kept him washed and changed his clothes but he was too much occupied with other things to stay with Robin for a very long at a time. The bells clamored as loudly as ever, but now the sound was associated with the regular procession of the monks going to devotions. Robin grew to like it. He began to sleep well on the hard cot and to feel at home in the little cell. He could see nothing but the sky through the small wind hole, for it was high in the stone wall and only in the early morning allowed a ray of sunshine to come in. Against another wall stood a prayer stool and desk com combined with a smaller one beside it. On the wall hung a little cupboard which held Brother Luke's few personal items and his breviary. And I looked up breviary ahead of time, and it is a book of uh, worship and meditation for the monks. Robin couldn't see into the corridor and at first couldn't identify all the sounds he heard. He liked the shing sound of feet on stone as the monks passed to and fro. Sometimes when they passed in procession chanting, he joined in the singing, for most of the plain songs were known to him. Sometimes there were long silences when he heard nothing but the mewing of the cat Millicent or the squeaking of the mouse she'd caught. There were hundreds of people within the hospice, but they were separated by thick walls and long passages. The outer court was far away at the other side of the monastery. There, visiting pilgrims, knights at arms, merchants, and minstrels gathered, each awaiting the attention of the prior. Because there were few inns, the monasteries were open for the entertainment of wayfarers, rich and poor alike. Besides, that portion reserved beside that portion reserved for travelers, there was an almonry overflowing with the poor of London, seeking food and clothing. St. Mark's was a busy place, but most of the activity was far away from Robin. He was much alone and time seemed long. And again, they're going to be using words about like almondry and vestry and um, these are all parts of the monastery and it just tells what the room is used for, like dining room or family room. And an almondry is just the part of the monastery where the poor people go when they want uh, food, clothing, money, need help. One day, Brother Luke said, it is time now to try these sitting up. He was rubbing Robin's legs as he did every day, talking the while. If thy hands are busy, time will pass more quickly. Dost thou like to whittle? Of course, answered Robin. Who does not? But I have naught to whittle. 
I shall find thee a piece of soft pine, and will lend thee my knife. Tis sharp and of good steel. This bench will fit against thy back to support thee. Brother Luke set the oaken bench at Robin's back and fitted a cushion for cushion for his comfort. So if you don't know what whittling is, pay attention to what they talk about. First of all, it needs wood and it needs a knife. We know that. Can I make a boat? asked Robin. Can I make it now? Brother Luke nodded and left the cell. It seemed long before he returned. Finally, he brought the knife and a piece of pine he'd promised. It felt smooth and clean to Robin's hands, and he liked to watch the small white shavings peel off. At first, he scarcely knew where to begin to bring out the shape of a boat, but little by little it began to round out, and at one end a point began to appear, as if it had been a prow. So now we know whittling is uh, where you shave the wood to make it look like something, a little bit like carving. Perhaps I can make it into a sailing boat like the fishermen bring to Beeland's Gate, or a barge, such as the king uses, he said. Perhaps when it's done, I will be able to walk and can go to the Thames to sail it. Perhaps, agreed the friar. It was very exciting, but Robin had to stop often to rest. Brother Luke brought soup in which dark bread was to be sopped. Robin didn't want any of it. He wanted only to go on with his whittling and turned away from the food. But "'Tis made of good mutton in which bay and marigold have been seized," Brother Luke coaxed. "'Brother Michael grows these fragrant herbs in the garden. "'Bay is tasty and gives good appetite. "'Marigold is said to be of value against poor sight and angry words. "'It is said twill draw even evil humors out of the head. "'And the flowers make fair garlands for maidens because of their golden color. What cared Robin for garlands for maidens? What cared he for fragrant herbs? Soppy food he despised. Brother Luke looked patient, said nothing, but continued to hold the food ready, and Robin gave in. He drank the soup and ate the bread dry, so he did not sop it, which would be putting the bread in the soup and then eating the bread. Because he had something interesting to do and to think about, Robin found the days passing more quickly. He began to recognize sounds as he had done before and to associate footsteps and differing gates with the people to whom they belonged. Now and then, one of the monks would look in on Robin to give him cheer or to say an ave, so he knew several of the monks by name and could tell which of them was passing. Brother Andrew, he knew, because he dragged one foot a little. Brother Thomas was walked very swiftly, heel and toe, heel and toe, whistling tunelessly under his breath as he went. Brother Paul was a large man, and when he walked through the corridor, the thudding of his feet seemed to shake the walls heavy as they were. Besides, one of his shoes squeaked. Robin worked steadily at his little boat. He finished the hull on the fourth day of the second week. I see this is to be a sailing boat after all, instead of a barge, said Brother Luke. It's somewhat awry, with the bow aslant from the stern. But it hath an air as if it had been battling a storm. Brother Luke brought small slender pieces of pine and showed Robin how to smooth them into mast and bowsprit, then found scraps of linen for sails and pieces of yarn for rigging. He even begged a scrap of silk ribbon from a traveler for Robin to use as a pennant for the masthead. As if the toy boat had belonged to the king's fleet, Robin thought. Never before had Robin done anything of the kind for himself. Always one of father's retainers had made what toys he wanted. Once Rolf had made him a hobby horse, and once Alfred the Dane had made him a boat but it had not seemed so fine as this one. Now he could hardly wait to begin something else. He'd like to carve one of those dwarfs, for example, such as those in the roof 
bosses at his father's house. Brother Luke suggested he try something easier. Patience, my son, he said. It takes great skill to carve figures like that. Why not make a simple cross? T'will be fit to hang over thy cot, if tis well made and smoothly finished. I'll find some pieces of wood and will show thee how to begin. Always while Brother Luke talked, he rubbed away at Robin's legs, then turned him and smoothed his back. Busy as he was, Brother, Brother Luke found time to bring Robin the pieces of wood he promised. These I saved from the pruning of the walnut tree that stands by the well, he said. It is weathered, for it hath lain in the sun and rain these many months. And how shall I fasten the pieces of the cross together, asked Robin. Shall I nail it then, or how shall it be done? Oh, when thou art ready for that, Brother Matthew will show thee answered the friar. Now make it smooth and fine, have it well proportioned, for it will be a keepsake and not a toy like that boat. But I leave to thy judgment, for tis part of the joy in making things. Each day the pieces of the cross grew smoother and better shaped, for Brother Luke would examine them and show how they were too wide here, too uneven there. Each day, too, Robin grew stronger and could work longer before resting. The knife fitted his hand and obeyed his thought more truly. One or two cuts on his finger had taught him caution. Many times Robin held the shorter piece of wood across the longer piece to see how it would look, and he would ask, isn't it time to put them together? But each time Brother Luke's fingers sought out rough places that must be rubbed down with pumice. Brother Luke was busy all day caring for the sick and the poor. From Vespers until the early bedtime, he served his turn in the scriptorium where all the writing was done. Once he had carried Robin to another part of the monastery and showed him where records of everyday living were written and poems and psalteries copied. Each monk had a small enclosure of his own where he, it would be quiet to do his work. Brother Luke set Robin down beside him on the oaken bench on his own particular place where he could spread out the pages of handwritten manuscript on which he was working. The pages were of sheepskin called parchment and were covered with careful lettering and decorations. Gold leaf illumined the capitals and the delicate tracery which bordered the pages. Robin wished he had known how to read what he saw. He wished he could dip the quill into the ink pot and inscribe letters and draw pictures such as Brother Luke had done. Will you teach me how to write? asked Robin. We were taught singing at the brother's school, but I know not writing. Will you teach me then? Yes, my son, truly I will. When there are not so many people to care for, but come now back to thy cot. First, we shall stop to say a prayer in the chapel for thy strengthening. He lifted Robin to his back again and started down the corridor. In some places, the passengers, the passages were so crowded, it was difficult to get through without stepping on someone. Old men and women in pitiful rags sat hunched against the wall or lay upon pallets. All right, I'm going to pause here a minute and talk about pallets. Today, when we talk about a pallet, it is wooden strips that are attached that you put other things on, like stone or, or, or boards. But when I was a little girl, I had, we had pallets like they're talking about here. And uh, when there weren't enough beds in a house, like when I would spend the night at my grandparents' house, they would make a pallet for me. And it was taking a blanket or a quilt and folding it to where it was the size of like a, a small mattress. And then you would sleep on that and they would give you a pillow and they'd give you a blanket to put on it. But it was a little bit softer than sleeping on the floor, but not nearly as comfortable as sleeping on a mattress. So they're gonna talk about pallets again and I wanted you to understand what a pallet was. 
Among them went the brothers of the order and sisters from the priory nearby, cleansing and feeding and dressing and comforting them. Ill-clad children ran about, and a small girl clung to Brother Luke and begged to be carried. A boy, not much older than Robin, came hobbling toward them on crutches. He smacked Robin as he passed and saluted him, seeing how Robin's legs were lame, even as his own. Good eve, Brother Crookshanks. He laughed and cried as if it had been a big joke to be lame. I see I have good company. Robin's anger rose at the familiarity. Now remember, Robin is a nobleman. He's used to having servants and people showing him respect, not being friendly like with like this child is, or saying that Robin is like him, a cripple. Keep your filthy hands off me, lout, he shouted. Hounds me. I am no more crook-shaped than you. But even as he spoke, Robin was considering the crutches and thinking how convenient they would be for himself. Then he remembered that even yet his legs would not support him for a moment. Brother Luke scolded the boy but laughed too at Robin's anger. Fie on thee for an impertinent lad. Still, Crookshanks he is truly. His legs will be as good as thine one day, boy, and then he shall keep the company right enough on his feet. He went on toward the chapel, speaking to Robin over his shoulder as they went. This lad meant no offense when he called thee Crookshanks, Master Robin. "'Tis but the way we all are named, for some oddity we have, or for where we live, or for what we do. This boy is called Geoffrey Atwater, because he lives by the River Fleet and tends the conduit there with his father. He was so called before he limped as he does now. "'Oh,' said Robin, "'I wondered why he's not called Geoffrey Crookshanks. Now I understand.'" Brother Luke went on to speak of other names and how they began. Now remember, we already talked about this a little bit, about people's last names coming from about this time in the Middle Ages. We had uh, John the Fletcher and John the Cook. And uh, today we would call them just John Fletcher and John Cook. But back then it told what their jobs were. All right, the, Brother Luke continues. Now I was called Chaucer because my father was a shoemaker. But since I've taken a vow to be a monk and to serve the Lord wherever I'm needed, I have taken the name of Luke, the physician in the gospel. Oh, and my father is Sir John de Bureford because he came from that place, Bureford. Is that the way it is? asked Robin. That is right of it, agreed the friar. When Geoffrey called thee Crookshanks, he did it because thy legs are thy legs and none others. Richard Smalltrot is he with the short step. And not Richard Crowfoot, whose feet splay out like fans. Robin laughed. They went into the chapel. It was empty, being between time for service. Brother Luke placed Robin on the sewn seat bordering the wall, propping him against the column which rose high to the vaulted roof. Say there thy prayers, he directed, and in thy mind know thou'st on thy knees. Forget not to be thankful for all thou hast. Remember thy lady mother and Sir John thy father who is at war, and pray for us all. Then he left Robin and went apart to his own devotions. Well, for what have I to be thankful for, Robin thought rebelliously. How will my father like a son who is called Crookshanks? But somehow, as he began his prayers, he felt better. Has that ever happened to you where maybe you're feeling angry or hurt or sad and then you decide to pray and it makes you feel better? Well, I'm glad that Robin has that opportunity to, to pray and feel better. Um, 
I don't think, honestly, that Robin will ever be called Crookshanks because he's of nobility. But it still is a concern of his that uh, when they are out on the streets that people might start calling him that. And Crookshanks basically means crooked legs. Crook is crooked and shanks are legs. Okay, that's all for now. See you later. Bye-bye.